Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We'll get started. How is everyone today? Yeah. Oh, a, a strong thumbs up. I like that. <laughs> it's a beautiful spring day in Georgetown, right? So, welcome to the Tuesday Lunch. Today, we are so delighted to have Dr. Tricia Bacon here. Tricia is an assistant professor at American University's School of Public Affairs. She is also the author of... Why Terrorist Groups <laughs> Form International Alliances, which we're all here to hear about today. In addition to her research that focuses on terrorist alliances, Trisha is also working on a book project right now that focuses on foreign fighters' influence and insurgencies, as well as, I don't know, a book project that I think sounds really captivating about terrorist leadership that she's co-authoring with me. Um, <laughs> and so, in addition to the book that we're going to talk about today, she has published articles on the Taliban's relationship with Pakistan, as well as the evolution of Lakshari Taiba. So you're welcome to ask questions and engage about this particular topic, as well as the other areas that Dr. Bacon researches. So, and again, in addition to terrorist group alliances, things like terrorist leadership, terrorist safe havens. So, Prior to her employment at AU, again in the School of Public Affairs, Dr. Bacon worked on counterterrorism for over 10 years at the Department of State, which included positions in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research, the Bureau of Counterterrorism, and the Bureau of Diplomatic Security. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bacon to Georgetown. Thanks, guys. So she's welcomed me, which is great, but the truth is this is a homecoming for me as well, because I got my PhD here. Um, which means that I'm both glad to be here, but I also have this sense of sweat and anxiety that I get with just walking on this campus that I literally don't even get when I'm in Mogadishu. So I'm glad to be here with you guys, but I can't deny that I've had some, some, tough, some tough days here, as I'm sure you guys have in, in the course of this very prestigious program. So I'd like to talk to you today about terrorist alliances. And really, this came into focus for me when I was in the counterterrorism community. And the idea that these relationships between terrorist organizations had become very central to how we understood the terrorist threat in the aftermath of 9-11. And it was even sort of in, indoctrinated into the counterterrorism strategy that came out in 2003. This idea that in order to really defeat this threat, we were going to have to start to sever the links between these groups. And at a very fundamental level, you probably haven't uh, thought about it explicitly unless you've spent 10 years looking at this topic, but the US approach to a lot of terrorist organizations since 9-11 has really been shaped by their alliances. There's no question that the Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb in Algeria gained qualitatively different counterterrorism attention from the United States when it became an affiliate, when it went from being the Salafist group for preaching and combat to Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. There's also no question that our investment in Somalia against Al-Shabaab is fundamentally driven by its relationship with Al-Qaeda and how that relationship shapes how we see this group. And we're seeing this sort of redux, if you will, with the Islamic State. If you had a, a fairly small insurgent group in Afghanistan that was mostly Uzbek, some Pakistani, some <laughs> sort of disaffected Taliban, and they conducted particularly brutal attacks, but really were a secondary actor in the insurgency, would you use the mother of all bombs on that organization if it wasn't affiliated with the Islamic State? I would venture to say that you probably wouldn't as a counterterrorism approach. And I'm not criticizing that necessarily because I think there is a substantial body of evidence about what these relationships do to the threat from terrorist organizations. There's a pretty compelling body of work that suggests that terrorist groups that have alliances become more lethal in their attacks. They tend to be more resilient, so they're able to recover from setbacks more readily. They tend to live longer. They tend to be more inclined to seek weapons of mass destruction. These relationships really do shape the kind of threat that these groups pose. And in particular, groups that are involved in an alliance network, either at the epicenter of it or allied with the epicenter of it, get these benefits even more than sort of the average alliances. And that's because you can see all of the things that terrorist groups can get through these alliances, right? They can get very tangible assets. They can get money, they can get weapons, they can get uh, material, they can get safe haven. They can also get some intangible assets too. They can get affiliation with a more prestigious organization or a cause that has more resonance once their original cause or sort of their founding cause has started to lose its ability to attract new fighters. They can get new operational skills. They can get trained in new techniques. 
and they can even get trained to conduct the same activities more efficiently or more effectively. So it's not even necessarily a new skill or a new technique. They also have an ability to, to share sort of the basic information that we almost think about in terms of like businesses, right? They can share best practices. They can share lessons learned. And you see this very much in the Bin Laden documents. It's one of the things Al-Qaeda was doing with the affiliates, was saying things like, to avoid drones, do this and that. Plant trees. And like, in a way you're like, plant trees, really Bin Laden? <laughs> but you see what he's doing there, right? He's trying to share what lessons they've learned in taking this pounding that they had in the federally administered tribal areas. They can also withstand counterterrorism pressure more readily, in part because they, they do have access to this kind of assistance. And an interesting sort of a component of it that we don't always think about is these alliances, and you really see this with the Al-Qaeda Islamic State dynamic, it helps to improve their position vis-a-vis -vis their rivals. So it's not even just about sort of their cause and their main adversary. It is also about the competition that they experience with other organizations. And so I have some colleagues at the University of Albany who about 10 years ago sought to map out the terrorist alliance sort of networks. And what they found was terrorist alliances tend to, I can't actually see that screen, so I'm just going to trust <laughs> that it, um, <laughs> the light is coming bright in on it. You see it in these cliques, that essentially the networks come in these little click type, um, not necessarily entirely close, but pretty, pretty consolidated. And in some of them, you go, you even see that there are these epicenters within it, right? You see that, oh, thank you, thank you so much. You see that there are these sort of very central organizations that are much more involved in alliances than other groups. And essentially when I was looking, and again, this is 10 years ago, this is before the Islamic State, you really find out when you look at this that there is a concentration of alliances that involve a few groups disproportionately. They emerge as disproportionately attractive partners. And so these were really the relationships I was the most interested in. And before I go any further, I always feel like I have to take a moment and sort of clarify what I meant when I say an alliance. Because when you say an alliance, especially to people who are studying international relations, you're like, terrorists have NATO? And like, that's obviously not what I mean, right? They're, they don't have the same sort of structured alliances that states have but they do have more formalized relationships than sort of ad hoc cooperation. They certainly engage in ad hoc cooperation as organizations, as individuals, and that cooperation is important. And I actually have a, a very good colleague who's written about sort of that lower level cooperation named Asaf Mogadam. So if you're interested in that topic, I think he does really good work on it. I am more interested in these formalized relationships. And so the way to think about them is, yes, they involve cooperation, but they also involve these expectations for the future. They involve expectations that you will coordinate and you will cooperate in the future. And what that does is it adds sort of that shadow that I can give you something today and you don't have to pay me today because I know tomorrow when I need something, I can come to you and you'll provide that assistance. So it, it adds sort of that dimension of expectations to, in the future to a relationship. And you can see that this is clearly important to terrorist organizations in the contemporary era in particular. Otherwise, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State wouldn't be anointing groups in a formal way as their allies. So they are seeking to create these kinds of relationships. So I really wanted to understand those more formalized kinds of relationships, but I don't want to overemphasize what I mean when I say formal, right, to, to how we think about states. The other dimension that I want to be clear about is I'm actually looking at a subset of alliances. In the title, they call them international alliances, and I think it's because, like, it's, it's less wordy than to say things like non-competition or non-rival, but that's actually what I mean. So if we think about the relationships between these groups, in particular, although no, not exclusively, when you look within a conflict, right? When we talk about the seven groups that comprise the Afghan Mujahideen against the Soviet Union, they were rivals with one another. They had relationships sometimes. They would ally during periods, they would cooperate. But they were also rivals because they were competing for the same resources, for the same recruits, for the same constituency, for the same state sponsors. They were in a state of zero sum, where essentially if someone else got it, it meant that you didn't. And so they're in this sort of state of rivalry. And we can think about this in Syria today when you look at the dynamics between the different Sunni extremist groups or Sunni rebel, rebel groups that are operating in Syria. And I raised the Islamic State earlier in, uh, in Afghanistan. The Islamic State in Afghanistan and the Taliban are in a very clear state of rivalry, right? That's one of the reasons even the Taliban has gone so far to directly attack them, 
that's that kind of dynamic where you're challenging each other for relative position within a movement. I'm looking at the relationships that essentially aren't those rivalries. The, the work on those, I think, is pretty compelling. And it says that the, they have these sort of zero-sum relative power considerations. They will ally with each other when they're trying to form smallest winning coalitions, when they're trying to manage the risk of exploitation by others. And there's, there's some good work, in particular by um, Fantini Christia, who's looked at this in uh, Bosnia and in Afghanistan in particular. And what she finds is that these relationships are temporary, they're tactical, they're shallow, and they're really, really fluid. They, you're friends today and you're not tomorrow. But there's this other dynamic, especially as, as terrorism became more and more international, that you could form alliances with groups that you weren't engaged in this kind of competition with. And it's not dichotomous purely. I, I sort of conceive of it as being on a spectrum. And it's about this political market. How much are you competing for resources in the same political market? And to use an obvious example, if we were talking about the IRA and FARC, you'd be like, yeah, no, they're not going after the same resource base, right? They're not recruiting from the same people, they're not looking at the same constituency, they have an overall similar thing going, but by and large, you, they're clearly not rivals. Um, when a case I'm going to talk about in more detail, the, PF, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine and the Red Army Faction in Germany. Again, these are groups that are clearly not rivals. It does get more nuanced, it can get, and it can get quite murky within the middle. And I raised earlier the idea that groups operating in the same conflict. And what I would say is, in, especially in the contemporary environment, you can have groups operating in the same conflict or in the same area who aren't rivals. And Al-Qaeda worked pretty hard at that in the federally administered administer tribal areas of Pakistan. It was not engaging in conflict. It was a predominantly Arab group, and it made an effort to not compete with the Pakistani militant groups that were operating there. Over the years, that sort of dynamic sort of changed when Al-Qaeda created a regional affiliate, and that added a dimension of competition. And even more than that, groups don't have to be co-located to be rivals. That's the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda right now, right? They're rivals even though they're predominantly located in other places. So in sort of the current environment, you have to look pretty hard at the dyads that you're interested in and evaluate how much are they competing in the same political market and how much is that competition defining their interactions. And when I was trying to sort of illustrate this idea, of course, You'll be surprised to learn that I love food. And so I thought about what food analogy would be helpful. And it occurred to me, if you, if you were going to see the Dairy Queen and Baskin Robbins were going to form an alliance, you'd be like, oh, they were clearly rivals, right? They're both doing delightful ice cream. And so they'd come together, and that was very much a rival dynamic. But I don't know if you've seen these, but uh, Baskin Robbins also has an alliance with Dunkin' Donuts, which is like, what heaven's going to be like if I ever get in. <laughs> and that's clearly a case of non-rivals, right? They had very different sort of um, things that they were offering, and they came together in this sort of complementary way. So that, that is the non-terrorism version of explaining this idea. But hopefully, it illustrates my point. And I think these non-rival alliances are really important to look at. And I think that for multiple reasons. I think that because they're not nearly as well understood as their rival counterparts. I think that they're important in particular because they dominate in the current threat environment. Um, you know, as a person who worked in the counterterrorism community for a long time, there's no doubt that that very much informs which research questions I think are of interest. And the last reason is these relationships, in contrast to the rival ones, have proven surprisingly resilient. Surprisingly resilient. These relationships are not being severed by counterterrorism pressure. There, I can't think of a single example of an alliance between two non-rival terrorist organizations that was severed because of counterterrorism efforts, which 18 years after 9-11 is actually in and of itself sort of an astonishing statement. And I think it's in part one of the things to consider is these relationships, once they form, prove to be pretty resilient, but they have really serious hurdles to formation. It can sort of seem like terrorist organizations are naturally inclined to ally with people. Like, they're all bad dudes, like they're going to work together kind of thing. But it's actually very, very complex and difficult for them to form these alliances. And I found that there's a number of hurdles. And some of them, I, get, I think, again, the analogy to a business or a state really illustrates it. Terrorist organizations don't have annual GDPs. They don't have earning statements, right? It's hard to get good, reliable information about terrorist groups. They are deliberately not transparent about things like how many members they have and how much money they have. But if you're looking for an alliance partner, you want to know those things. 
So they don't have really good information about one another. So they have to rely on like very visible information, like how much territory do you control? A major attack that sort of demonstrates that you have a high level of capability. So they, they have real information problems in evaluating partners. They also are not well positioned to essentially show that they're going to follow through on commitments. So part of the alliance is the belief that your partner will help you later on. Well, in any kind of these relationships, it's always easier to defect later. It's easier for me to take the money you give me now and then not pay you back. And so these groups have that same sort of problem. And some of them don't even live long enough, right? These groups don't necessarily have very long lifespans. So there's not a lot of ways to ensure commitment. You can't sue a terrorist group if it doesn't pay you back, right? So it's, they operate in a very different sphere in that realm as well. Alliances almost always in the contemporary environment involve increasing counterterrorism pressure. As I said earlier, Al-Shabaab, AQIM, their affiliation with Al-Qaeda undoubtedly increased the amount of counterterrorism pressure that they're experiencing. So groups have to be prepared that they're going to experience more counterterrorism pressure, and that's a major hurdle. The, another hurdle to these relationships is when they form these relationships, both groups are giving up something, right? They're giving up some attention, some resources, some personnel in, in assisting their partner. And sometimes those are tangible resources, and that can be a source of frustration. Sometimes it's attention. You will see that groups will maybe not completely alter the kinds of targets that they strike or the tactics that they use, but they often make adjustments, and they're making accommodations for their partners. So you also see that sort of change, and that can be very internally divisive, because sometimes it involves pursuing a cause that was not the cause that you joined for. And that, we see in a number of cases, causes a lot of internal consternation. You, groups can't, there, there's sometimes a strange standard that is applied to terrorist alliances, which is the idea of control. Nobody's controlling anyone. Even when you take on someone's name, you're not controlled by that. And so sometimes these organizations do things that their partners are like, don't, why did you do that? And you see this very clearly in um, Atiyah and Zawahiri's letters to Zarqawi, where they're like, why did you hit a wedding in Jordan? What was the calculus there? Why are you beheading these guys? They're clearly, he's undertaking acts that are hurting Al-Qaeda, but they can't get him to stop, right? This is one of the dynamics that is a, a risk and a hurdle to forming these kinds of relationships, that you're going to incur the costs of the behavior of your partner. These relationships fairly consistently can struggle because of language and cultural problems, which is a theme I'll return to when I talk about one of the cases. And terrorist leaders, which is something Dr. Arsenault and I are looking at in another project, are very important in alliances. You don't see alliances form very often if the leaders can't get on board. And I'm sure you're all going to be shocked to learn that terrorist leaders don't necessarily work that well together, right? They've got, we've got some big egos, we've got some big ambitions, and they don't always cooperate very well together. So you can see them sort of clash, oftentimes because someone is subordinating to some degree or another in this alliance process. Not always, but often. And I think most seriously, and probably most underestimated, when you form an alliance with another organization, you are opening yourself up to what is the existential risk, that you're going to be infiltrated, that you're going to be betrayed, that you're going to be detected in some kind of way that you wouldn't have been if you didn't open things up to this other partner. This is the most serious risk. I can't overstate what a serious risk this is to terrorist organizations. So these are tremendous hurdles, right? that these groups have to experience to try to form these alliances. And it's interesting because the resilience of them is at odds with that. But it's once they, it seems as though once these groups overcome these hurdles to form these alliances, the alliances have some sticking power. And that suggested to me that there, was, there would be a lot of merit to understanding the alliance formation process, why they align, because disruption might be more possible at that earlier phase of this, this process. So, that's the query that motivated this book. Why are terrorist organizations forming these alliances? So let's throw back. Not all of us were alive in the 70s, so I'll set the stage for you. Um, this is a very different era for terrorism, right? Brian Jenkins' quote is sort of, that captures it the most succinctly, I think. The idea that in the 1970s, the predominant sort of theme and attitude of terrorists was they wanted a lot of people watching and they didn't want a lot of people dead, right? 
most of the time now we think of them as wanting both. There is not the same reservations about lethality. They want a lot of people watching and they're fine if there are a lot of people dead. And so it raised a question in my mind. When we look at contemporary terrorist organizations and their behavior, how much, especially when it comes to alliances, is different also from that period till now? Are there things that have changed like that that would also shape their alliance behavior? Or do we see more continuity over time in terms of how they relate to one another? And what I found was, in fact, alliance motives remained constant over this period of time, from the 70s, the 80s, to the contemporary period. And that is that the main motive, the main thing that the main impetus for alliances is really about the organization, much more than the cause. It's about organizational weaknesses. The thing that motivates groups to seek partners is that they're experiencing some kind of organizational shortfall and weakness that they can't address on their own, or they don't think they can address on their own. So this is how alliances then help to produce the things that we talked about earlier, which is enabling them to recover from losses, enabling them to survive. It's, this is what is driving that result, is that this is about sort of their organizational condition. And another thing that was constant from that period till now was what we saw when, when I showed you the, um, the breakdown of the networks. Even in that period in the 70s, you had a few organizations that were disproportionately at the center of a few alliance networks. You had these hubs around which other organizations were revolving. So let me sort of illustrate this by talking about a case from the 70s that will hopefully illustrate what I found. So let's, get, let's set the stage. Now we're in the 60s, when I wasn't alive either. So there were in West Germany. And this is the period where you're seeing, not in just West Germany, but all over the world, you have this sort of stream of far left and left wing protest movements. In West Germany, one of the big causes, although not the only one, was the Vietnam War, of course. So right, we, we even remember this or read about this in the United States. In West Germany in particular, the Vietnam had more resonance than in some places because we have a, we have a sizable US military presence. So they drew a direct link between the US military presence in West Germany and the war in Vietnam. So that made that puts more heat behind the protests, if you will. But there was something else I think more subtle at, at work here. And that was also that in the aftermath of the disaster of World War II and Nazism, West Germany had sort of as a culture started to look to the United States as the model for how the country re rehabilitates itself, how it comes out of the, the shame of the period before it. And the Vietnam War, and the, 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 their view about how the US was conducting the war in Vietnam sort of shattered the idea that the US could be a model for West Germany. And amongst the protest movement in particular, that meant that the whole system was suspect. Like the whole thing was a facade. And so students and young people increasingly started to interrogate sort of the, the structure and the system they were living in. They, they started to see a lot of Nazis who were still in power and still had pretty powerful positions within the West German government. And they started to really reject the overall system in West Germany. And it's interesting because, and you can see in this, you know, the, the uh, America with the K, there's a very, very strong sort of Holocaust invoking in this protest movement. And you might think, because of that, that it would be a very pro-Israeli protest movement. But actually, it was the contrary. After the 1967 war and the gains that Israel made in that war, this protest movement became very strongly identified with the Palestinian liberation movement. And they really saw that as a cause, I would say, on par even with the Vietnam War. So there was a very strong sort of identification and ideological uh, inclination towards the Palestinians, which, of course, will become important later. So you have this protest movement, and really you have a series of them, and you're not seeing any changes. And we see this in a lot of places. The movement was not producing any of the political changes that the protesters wanted. And then there's this, this a sort of seminal event where a protester is shot in the back of the head. And it's during a protest against the visit of the Shah in Iran. And there's this iconic photograph that's all over the press of him dying and um, being sort of cradled by this, this woman who's a bystander. And the radical fringe, this really sets them over the edge. This particular, this is a tipping point event that makes them say, this non-protest movement is not working. It's time to escalate. So that's what they decide to do. 
they don't really, you know, work this through in a strategic way. They firebomb a department store after hours. Amateurish, I don't know, boo capitalism, like I'm not sure what, what they really thought they were going to accomplish with this act. It's just sort of an act of rebellion. It's not a very constructive or well thought through effort. So it's symbolic, it's amateurish, it destroys a bunch of stuff. But really it captures this feeling that was growing, which is we can't, Nonviolence is not going to work with this generation. The generation in power is the Nazi generation. They only understand violence. So they start to escalate. And of course, when you do something like that, you're, you're arrested right away. And so that's what happens with this group. They're arrested right away. And they're freed on bail. And they decide, well, we, bail's not a thing. We're just going to flee. And then their leader, Andreas Bader, is rearrested and um, detained shortly thereafter, within weeks thereafter. And he has a very committed partner in Gudrun Eslin, and she decides that she's gonna break him out. She's part of the ones who skipped bail. So she devises a plan to try to break him out of prison. And it involves a name that probably many of you have rec will recognize as well, which is Yurik Meinhof. She's a far left journalist in the, the West German sort of circuit. So she arranges to conduct an interview with Andreas Bader and get the prison to move him to a third location, a library. And while he's there, they come in, guns blazing, and break him out of prison. And with this act, you then hear of the Bader Meinhof gang, right? This is where you, that terminology comes from. It suggests she was a much more senior person in the group than she was, but I digress and we can talk about that later. What it calls itself, of course, is the Red Army Faction. And the, so they break out of, him out of prison and they regather and they're like, okay, we're ready to for real undertake a campaign. We're not going to just do this sort of amateur firebombing stuff in the middle of the night. We're ready. There's a problem, though. They don't have weapons. They don't have training on how to use weapons. They don't know how to undertake the campaign that they just decided to undertake. So they have to figure out what to do in the midst of a manhunt for them because someone was injured in the, in the breaking out of Bader. So they turn to the Fata representative who is based in West Germany. And they say, we need weapons and we need to like, learn how to fire them, basically. And he says, okay, if you want to do that, we have some camps in Jordan and we'll welcome you. This is before they sort of shifted to Lebanon. This is the Jordan period. We welcome you to come to them if you guys want to come. And they're like, great. So they take off and they go into to Jordan. And they, the, when they arrive, the Palestinians are like, oh, these West Germans are, like, in a word, they're adorable, right? They're not, <laughs> Palestinians are not taking them particularly seriously. And so they show them the refugee camps. They show them the orphanage. They show them some, like, show, um, you know, training circuit. And then they say, so you're good, right? You're going to go back home and talk about the Palestinians. So they want attention for the Palestinian cause. They don't care about what the West Germans are doing. But the West Germans insist. No, no, we're like for real. We want to train, we want these skills. Let us come to your camps. So they do. And again, it, it's dated now, so it's a little comedic if you can, which you have to at some point when you work on terrorism enough there, you have to have a threshold of being willing to laugh at things of a certain level of absurdity anyway. So they arrive, and Bader and Enslin want to make sure they have mixed sleeping arrangements, and the Palestinians are like, that's not how this works. <laughs> You're not married. And they complain there's not enough meat, they can't get soda. I mean, they fulfill the expectations that the Palestinians initially thought of them, right? They are a pain in the butt. And Bader insists that he won't wear the uniforms. He's going to wear his leather pants in Jordan, <laughs> training. Like, they're absurd. They're acting absurd, okay? And so the, the Palestinians are getting frustrated with them. But the West Germans actually get pretty frustrated too because learning to slit the camel of uh, a belly of a camel is not what they need to know how to do in West Germany, right? The Palestinians are not training them on the kinds of combat skills they need in an urban environment in West Germany. So the, it's this sort of constant clash. So the West Germans start to act up and they start <laughs> firing their weapons all the time. They're not hitting anything. And the other trainees who are, you know, regular Palestinians, some Arabs from other countries, get rationed food and rationed ammunition. So it's also causing a lot of strife in the camp. So their trainer decides, all right, you're, we're training you like everyone else. You only need to use this much ammunition. You only get the same amount of food. And we're going to treat you like everyone else. So what do the West Germans do? They do what any good capitalist, Democrat, they go on strike. <laughs> <laughs> they camp, right? And 
while they're on, on strike, the women start sunbathing, they're not wearing a lot of clothes, and the culture clashes just sort of keep going. And it's really, uh, the trainers and the other trainees have had it. So then sort of the real deal shows up to the camp. Ali Hassan Salami, and he'll be go on to, to no, notoriety on a great scale for planning the 1972 Munich Olympi Olympic attacks. He's not training in leather pants, right? He is, he is the real deal. He's got a lot of experience, and so he meets with these guys and is like, what is happening here? The West Germans are so useful in theory, but these West Germans are not. And so they have the, a meeting. He tries to, to, you know, to, to smooth things over but they don't stop. So the next time they get everybody pissed off at the camp, the Palestinians tell them it's time to leave. Thanks for coming. If you need help in the future, call us. We'll see what we can do, but that's enough. So essentially they end, they've had this cooperation. There's the prospect for future cooperation, but they haven't succeeded in forming an alliance. So the West Germans return to West Germany and they prepare to launch a campaign. Now for all of their complaining, they clearly learned something. Because in short order, beginning in May 1972, they set off three pipe bombs at a U.S. military hall in Frankfurt. They kill one and they injure a dozen. And then they bomb the car of a federal judge who signed an arrest warrant for them, a conservative media outlet, and another U.S. military facility. So in a very short period of time, they launch this campaign. And in a very short period of time, they are all arrested, as you can imagine. So they're all in prison. And the West German government really sees them as such a threat that it decides to undertake sort of extreme imprisonment conditions. And this creates a cause onto itself. So they're kept in isolation with those very cold temperatures, very bright lights, all white walls, soundproof walls. And they're, so they're all going a little crazy, especially for a terrorist group right, where they were so close knit and so used to interacting with each other. So they start to say that they're being tortured by the West German state. And they are thereby able to portray the West German state as the very kind of state that they said it was all along. So this creates a tremendous amount of outside sympathy. They go on hunger strikes and one of them dies uh, in 1972. He's like 6'5", and when he dies, he's like 110 pounds. It's, you know, things, they, they are able to create this sort of momentum. So they get a lot of supporters on the outside. And it essentially, spawns a new generation of extremists who don't start with nonviolent protests and then firebombing and sort of the whole progression. They join this ready to go. And the West Germans are able to disrupt a few attempts to reconsolidate, but eventually you have a generation uh, that's able to coalesce. And they get a lot of assistance from the prisoner's lawyers and a few of the prisoners who get out early sort of on lower level charges, not the leadership. So they come together and their primary objective, of course, yes, they want to bring down the West German system and capitalism, etc. But what they really want is to break out the prisoners. And that is their overriding objective. So they then realize they, they're ready to go violence-wise, like they don't need this progression in terms of getting ready for violence, but they don't know how to conduct violence either. They don't know what to do in order to create the kind of hostage taking that will compel the re release of the prisoners. So they do exactly what their predecessors do. They turn to Fatah. But it's 1975, and Fatah's going legitimate at this point. And it's not interested in engaging in international terrorism or supporting West Germans to do so. But it does broker an introduction with the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, particularly its special operations group, which is a sort of element that was created to engage solely in international terrorism. So they make the introduction to that. And this is also a group that has by now created, created a pretty extensive alliance network onto itself. And it's led by this man, Wadi Haddad. It's a very small, covert, it's exact relationship to the PFLP is something that if you're in these circles, we could talk about for hours and we would all disagree, but none of us would really know. It's very hard to pinpoint it, and it's probably by design. So we'll just say semi-autonomous and sort of skip the nerdy debate. But you get what I mean. They're in this sort of amorphous dynamic where they're really only engaging in international terrorism. And I think of Wadi Haddad as sort of the equivalent of a Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, for those of you who are into the Al-Qaeda operation scene. He is an operational genius, and they call him the master. He's, he's exceptional at this. And what he's exceptional at more than anything are these hostage shaking operations, which are sort of the big tactic of the time. And he revolutionized the plane hijackings. He's the one who sort of introduced that into the era of the 70s. 
So the West Germans show up, they run training facilities in South Yemen. So again, they've got the Haven, they've got the camps. So the West Germans show up in South Yemen and it goes much better this time. These West Germans are prepared to undertake the kind of training that the, their counterparts are gonna offer them, but their counterparts also understand what kind of training they want and are able to provide it. And the West, they help the West German come up with a series of plots, and then they train them on how to conduct those kinds of hostage-taking attacks. And they, they are, there is a, a strong sort of um, compatibility in both what they want and what they're able to do. And culturally, they're just able to navigate it much, much better, too. And when they, the West Germans show up in the 70s, they think they're better than the Palestinians, and the Palestinians think they're amateurs. This time, there, there is a sense of sort of mutual respect and trust that they develop over their time in the camp together. So the West Germans return. In 1977, they launch this series of operations. Now, they were trained by the best, but they do struggle. They end up accidentally killing uh, a prosecutor and the head of a major bank when they're trying to kidnap them. Um, and more importantly, they face a West German government by the end of the 1970s who isn't capitulating to hostage-taking operations anymore. Those have been going on all through the 1970s, and governments are realizing for every time you agree to these demands, there are five attacks behind it. So the West Germans have really increased their resolve. So the, the RAF decides to culminate this in the attack of a man named Hans Martin Schleyer, who's there on the left in September 1977. And he's a very complex figure. He's certainly a victim. Um, there's an individual named Stefan Aust who wrote a book on the group, and he has this really perfect quote where he says he was a man positively destined for this role. He was a friend of the prime minister, he's a very prominent businessman, and he is a former SS officer. So from the Red Army faction standpoint, he is the perfect sort of target. And they execute the kidnapping him of him with pinpoint precision. They figure out a street that's one way, they have one of their operatives walk in front of it with a baby tram causing his motorcade to stop. I mean, they execute this kidnapping. They got better after their early mistakes. But the force of the West German government comes crashing down on the group after they kidnap Schleyer. So what does the group do? They turn to the PFLP Special Operations Group and they ask for Haven, and they take them. They have some offices in Iraq and they say, come, you can hide here and wait this out. So once again, the alliance is really coming in at this critical time. A month after the, the kidnapping, the West German government isn't moving. So the PFLP Special Operations Group offers to undertake a plane hijacking in support of the effort. And so it kidnaps a plane leaving Mallorca for Frankfurt. It's got 86 passengers, mostly vacationers, that are West Germans. And they, they have a lot of trouble finding where to land. Eventually, they land in Mogadishu and they reinforce the Red Army faction's demands for the release of the prisoners. But like I said, the West German government's had enough of these, and so it launches a rescue operation, and it kills three of the hijackers and all of the passengers except one, a pilot who had been killed earlier in the process. So the leaders of the group back in prison have had enough. There's too many failures to release them. They're not doing this anymore. So they. There's a lot of debate about this too, but they basically they staged their suicide in prison. Now, some people argue that the state killed them, and you can't deny they shouldn't have had guns and knives in their cell. That's a problem. But what it looks like to me is that they staged their suicides to look like a murder, which again is going to invoke the cause and sort of keep the next generation going, but they couldn't stay in prison anymore in their own estimation. So what happens on the outside? the group collapses, right? This is what the whole purpose of this generation was, was to release these prisoners, and they failed to do that. So they're, they're living sort of in desolation. But the PFLP Special Operations Group allows them to just keep staying in their haven and living in their camp in the meantime. So in this sort of anecdote, you can see how much these groups got, how much the RAF got from this alliance, right? It got the operational skills, it got the cachet of being associated with the Palestinians, it got safe haven, it got guidance, it got reinforced operations. It, it very much filled what we talked about in terms of being able to increase the lethality of the group, its ability to recover, its ability to survive longer. It got all of the benefits of those alliances, of the, all the alliance benefits. And it got a model of how this works, how to be the center of an alliance network. So after three or four years of regathering, the Red Army faction decides it's going to reinvent itself. And it's going to launch a Euro terrorist, or a Euro terrorist campaign. 
and it reaches out to a bunch of other left-wing groups in Europe, forges alliances with a bunch of them, and becomes sort of the, the equivalent, not nearly as sophisticated, but the equivalent of the center of an alliance network like the PFLP Special Operations Group. And it ends up being the longest lasting left-wing group in Europe. It finally disbands in 1998. It's 30 years. It's a pretty impressive run for a terrorist organization. And during that time, of course, it continues to hit US military targets, prominent businessmen. It's able to, to survive quite a while. The fall of the Berlin Wall is sort of the thing that ultimately brings it down. So why do I tell you the historical case? I mean, I think it's a story that conveys what I'm talking about. But also in a time when terrorists wanted a lot of people watching and not a lot of people dead, it still shows this alliance made the group qualitatively more dangerous. It allowed it to get the skills, to get the haven, to, to undertake this violent campaign that it would not have been able to otherwise. It allowed the group to survive when it wouldn't have otherwise. There's a lot of analysts that argue without Fatah and the PFLP, this group doesn't last more than two years. And instead, it lasts for 30. I think it also shows that alliances are not that easy to form. The first effort, while absurd in some ways, also shows that there's a lot of ways that this can go wrong. It can be cultural, it can be a mismatch in what one side can provide and the other side can need, um, but it, it also shows that that's not that easy to do. And I think that that is constantly obscured when we're talking about these relationships, how difficult they are to form. And it exemplifies the pattern that we still see today. The PFLP Special Operations Group did what we see ISIS and we see Al-Qaeda doing for its partners. This, the, the increase in the capability, the ability to give resources, guidance, safe haven, training. This is a pattern that we've seen repeat in the current dynamic. And I think it's also, most importantly for my purpose, motivates what illuminates these relationships. And that was, in each case, those organizational needs, that the organizational weakness. And there, are, there is a role for things like ideology. It tended to lean towards searching for partners that it shared an ideology with. It's like ideology helped with partner selection, it helps with alliance formation, but what motivated it was this alliance weakness, this organizational weakness, not ideology. So I think it captures a lot of those things and then shows also the outcome of these alliances. So where we are more recently, we don't have a lot of terrorists wearing leather pants anymore and you know, complaining about getting soda in Syria, but there are some, some common things. And when I was an analyst at the State Department in 2005, I was responsible for analyzing the negotiations that were going on between the Salafist group for preaching and combat in Al-Qaeda. And they were deliberating whether or not the GSPC was gonna become part of the Al-Qaeda affiliate network. So we were watching these talks and they weren't, it wasn't clear what was going to happen. It was no, by no means sort of an obvious slam dunk sort of thing. So I went to see what, what's out there that can help explain these relationships so I can use that to understand whether this is going to happen. And I found remarkably little research on this topic. There was this sort of invoking of, alliance, of ideology and common enemies, and those tend to be things that are too static to explain why an alliance occurs at a specific time. And it can't really explain why these certain organizations are particularly desirable alliance partners. It can't explain why alliances succeed or fail. It certainly can't explain why you're picking Al-Qaeda versus ISIS, right? Ideology does, it's not an ideological lineup of which organization they have, uh, other groups have picked. So what we see is there is this correlation between ideology and common enemies, but it, that's not enough to understand what is actually the impetus in motivating these relationships. And in the GSPC case in particular, there is a group that had lost a ton of, of its operatives to a recent amnesty. Its leader was in talks to undertake the amnesty as well. It had lost the ability to recruit domestically because in 2005, any Algerian who was interested in the cause was more interested in going to Iraq than fighting in the desert in Algeria. So this is a group that was experiencing tremendous shortfalls. And Al-Qaeda could offer those things. It could offer it a name that would give it more resonance it could then, and allow it to recruit again. After they do form the alliance, the GSPC starts using suicide attacks for the first time. So it, cre it gives it a lot of those advantages. Al-Qaeda was a partner who could do that. And they shared an ideology, but they had shared an ideology for seven years before this alliance formed. So again, it helps to explain who, why they selected each other as partners, but not really what, what was the motive behind the alliance. And overall, I've tended to find that organizational shortfalls occur when a group is young, when it's experienced a lot of losses, or when its adversary has gained some kind of major new counterterrorism capability. So when we look at Al-Qaeda today, 
you can see its, it's relevance in the, the terrace landscape is largely a function of its alliances. When was the last time Al-Qaeda Corps conducted a major attack? But when you look at its alliance network, you can see why it's still a quote unquote major actor in the global terrorist sphere. It's, it has a fairly extensive reach. And even if you just look at its affiliates, you can still see why it has some global terrorist effect. And in fact, the most recent DNI threat assessment basically says the threat from Al Qaeda is, is emanates from its affiliates. Its affiliates and its alliances are what have allowed it to survive and maintain its relevance in the last 18 years, something it really wouldn't have been able to do on its own. Because when you just strip it down to Al-Qaeda core, I would add that I could put some lines in Syria, maybe a few in Iran, but the core of it is in Afghanistan and Pakistan, you're seeing a much more manageable threat if you start to strip away its alliances bit by bit. But stripping away its alliances has proven to not be possible. The US has been unable to do that. Yes, they had a break with ISIS, but that was much more about the internal dynamics between Baghdadi and Zawahiri, right? This is not about something the United States did from a counterterrorism perspective. More than that, none of Al-Qaeda's affiliates defected to ISIS. They should have, right? ISIS had the caliphate, it had the foreign fighters, it had the charismatic leader, it had all the money. Remember the reports, it had like gold coming out of its ears, like it had everything. And none of Al-Qaeda's affiliates defected. These alliances are proven to be exceptionally resilient. And of course, we find ourselves in the same situation today. After ISIS declared the caliphate and made the call, it got dozens of allies. And it now has named them you know, accordingly as part of its willyouts. It followed that same sort of Al-Qaeda model in anointing groups. And that it allowed its uh, affiliates to have the additional cachet and to be able to recruit and get more resources. It was a boon for a lot of these groups. And now that ISIS is struggling, now that it sustains some losses, it also has partners it can turn to, to maintain its relevance, to rebuild in the interim. So I think that it is as relevant as ever to understand why these relationships have formed. And that is to say that in my assessment, yes, you have a lot of lone wolves, you have a lot of inspiration, but you, the core of our terrorist threat that we face is these two organizations and their alliance networks. And so we really need to understand what is motivating these relationships so that we can, we can intervene at an earlier point because they are so vulnerable. Because in every case I looked at, there were vulnerabilities. And there were points where the alliances looked like they might not happen. None of them were just sort of obvious natural outcomes to these negotiations. So my hope is that this book will be a contribution to that end. And so with that, I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have. And you have my email address. And I sort of made a dig on my, my trauma years when I was here at Georgetown before. But I do want to show you my cat named Hoya. <laughs> so I also still love Hoya. So very happy to talk alliances, talk terrorism, talk State Department, talk volleyball. I like volleyball. Not related. <laughs> Whatever you guys play. Yes. So, um, for, if I understand correctly, so the the benefit of the beginning is that once an alliance happens, the uh, group has more resiliency. What about in terms of moving towards um, becoming more legitimate? Like, does it help them become more legitimate, or does it just make them a bigger targets? Not so. For example. Like, if we look at FARC or if we look at uh, YPG, or, or and does it also depend on who are they aligning with? So like, if like YPG is is partnering with the US where, where, or where that FARC is just transitioning into a government role. So like, does it, does it help them achieve their aims or does it more just, they don't achieve their aims, but they also just can't get wiped out? So it does very much depend on who they're aligned with. And, and sort of the corollary to that is who they're seeking legitimacy with, right? When a group allies with Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State, they're not seeking legitimacy in the international system, right? Or with states, they're seeking legitimacy amongst their perceived constituency of Muslims. Um, but yes, and I think that that's one of the interesting things that we see is that's part of all, that is a consideration in partner selection. And we see that groups that have Ter sort of terrorist wings, political parties, charitable organizations, they tend to be more complex in sort of who they're willing to ally with because allying with a purely terrorist organization or a purely violent organization can hinder what they're trying to do on the political and the social service front. So that, that is part of how they consider who to ally with, which is why it was a, 
and it's not an exception, but it's a sort of convenient fiction to have a wing that's your terrorist wing, right? Because then you can sort of isolate it like the special operations group. It can work with the other terrorist groups and give a little bit of plausible, plausible deniability to other elements of the group. So that's a very convenient arrangement that a lot of groups undertake so they can get these kinds of relationships without damaging the legitimate legitimacy of the rest of the organization. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much for the presentation. You're welcome. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, number one, you've talked a lot about why terrorists formed alliances. Yeah. And you said that these alliances, when they once they are formed, they are usually very resilient. Can you explain more on that? Why they are resilient? Why a lot of pro-Al-Qaeda um, terrorist groups in Southeast Asia, for example, don't ally with ISIS? Yeah, I, that's actually the project I'm working on sort of now, to be honest right. with you. Right. I've, I've started looking pretty hard at um, Al Shabaab in particular, which I saw as, as the potential link, w weak link in the Al Qaeda affiliate network. It was the last affiliate to come on before Bin Laden's death. It didn't rename itself, and ISIS courted it pretty hard. And there was even sort of internal pressure within Al Shabaab to defect. And so I've been trying. I did. I've done some field research and I've been looking pretty hard in that to that case. And then the hope is then, of course, to look at a series of them and see. And I think there was a couple things about it that stood out, at least in the Shabab case, that are sort of the, the initial findings that I'm thinking about. One is that it's so hard for them to forge trust that once they do, it's it's such a risk to turn somewhere else to try to do that again. Like. All of um, Al-Qaeda's affiliates knew by the time ISIS came around that when they asked Al-Qaeda for something, Al-Qaeda would do it. It would do its best, even if it couldn't give the exact amount of money or the exact resources or the exact... Al-Qaeda had proven to be a reliable partner who would, would try to do those things. You're going with a less known quantity, and that in and of itself is a risk, right? So there was a lot of existing trust. The other thing about the Al-Qaeda network that came up in the Shabab case is some of the affiliates have formed alliances between each other over the years. In particular, AQAP has emerged as sort of it's a hub onto its own, especially when Al-Qaeda core became weakened, AQAP became like the flag bearer, and it also forged alliances with some of the other Al-Qaeda partners. And so while Al-Qaeda core was weak when ISIS was strong, AQAP was also doing quite well for itself. And Al-Shabaab in particular is close with AQAP, they're right are they very ready to access to each other? And the third thing that I found is that the leadership of these groups has sworn by out. This is, this is the difference in contemporary times where you have a by out of swearing of allegiance, which is not easy to break. It's not, some people sort of think it's exaggerated how important it is. The thing I would say is leaders are swearing by out to ISIS or to Al Qaeda. Their members are swearing by out to them. So if they're breaking a by out, they're showing that's a thing that you do in a way that is not necessarily good for their own leadership um, sort of survival. And also, when, other, when the rank and file starts to question whether or not to change alliances, they're challenging their leadership. And so what we saw in the Shabab case is they viewed that whether or not, maybe, maybe they had their own doubts about what they should do, but when the challenge came from below, it was a challenge to them as leaders that they wanted to tamp out. They didn't, they didn't want to encourage that kind of behavior. So what I found in that case is a really, multi-causal answer that I'm not sure how sort of idiosyncratic it is to Al-Shabaab yet. That's sort of the next phase of the research. Because that's exactly the question that emerged for me in doing this project. Yeah. Uh, thank you again for coming in. Yeah. And I like the analogy you have kind of comparing it to a business. So sort of on that same line, uh, what measures do the hubs that these terrorist groups have to sort of control the brand or like a quality control in their affiliates. That is the massive downfall with this model, right? Is that you're giving your name to another organization, often in these cases, the vast majority, I'm trying to think there's an exception, you're not co-located with that. So you're giving that to someone who's then operating in another sphere. So your ability to manage and control them is really, really limited. Okay. And that is a, has been a massive source of frustration for Al-Qaeda. My sense is it's not as much of a frustration for ISIS. And that's because Al-Qaeda was much more intent on calibrating violence and directing it towards the primary, its primary objective of the US, the West. It wanted to downplay the local, upplay the far enemy. ISIS is like, let's fight everybody all the time. So it doesn't have, and it's also not squeamish about violence. Like, Al-Qaeda sent things chastising, not just Al-Qaeda in Iraq, but 
Al-Shabaab and others saying, don't attack in markets. This is not, markets are not where you're attacking. That's where Muslims are. We are trying to win them. If you want to attack the convoy, you know, the U.S. military convoy, wait till it's outside of the markets, that kind of thing. They were very frustrated by those kinds of things. I don't think ISIS has those same kind of reservations, at least in its current iteration. Mm -hmm. It's not as strategic in that way. Um, so in, in a way, it's easier for ISIS in the affiliation. On the other hand, ISIS demanded much more, relinquishing much more autonomy of its, its allies than Al-Qaeda did. It wanted to be able to decide who the leaders were. Al-Qaeda like, wanted to be asked. It wanted to have a say. ISIS is saying, no, we're going to appoint our leaders. We decide who your leaders are. We decide. So it asked for more capitulation. So they sort of took that. That was a difference in their approach. But I think you hit on exactly what the problem is with this franchising model, is once the name is given, the only way to get around that is to take it back. Mm -hmm. And Al-Qaeda proved very, very, very reluctant to do that, except finally, after a lot of problems, right, with ISIS. That took 10 years of a very tumultuous relationship. So that is, a, I think, a, a serious sort of exploitable flaw in this dynamic. Okay, thank you. Hi. Um, First off, thank you so much, Professor, for coming to talk to us today. Um, so my question is about uh, the relevance of brands at the local level, um, like or distinguishing between brands. So like specifically with Al Qaeda and ISIS, one of the interesting things that uh, we've noticed, like at least in like in Africa, in Burkina Faso, actually, we've seen like situations where the same kind of groups of people or local like kinship links will connect people in ISIS and like ISIS franchise to an Al Qaeda franchise. Yeah. And my question is, do you think that in the long run, kind of uh, these brands will matter very much to to jihadists as they continue to work kind of in the same community in the same like network? Um, or, or are they, you know, enduring? Are the Al Qaeda and ISIS brands going to be per permanent, distinguishable kind of strains of jihad uh, at the local level? I think when you get down to the local level, it starts to look more like the rival dynamics that I talked about, right? Where there's you have cooperation, it's fluid, and you you also are trying to take advantage of each other. It, you get into those dynamics at the local level between the Al Qaeda affiliates and the ISIS affiliates. So there's still competition, but they're behaving in cooperative ways too. Rivalry doesn't mean you don't cooperate, right? It means that you're doing so with a very clear eye towards, you know, what your the, your rival might be gaining from it. And you do see, like, even in um, between the Taliban and ISK in Afghanistan, which has had a pretty serious rivalry, you see some of that happen at local levels, local villages, people have known each other. You do see that kind of fluid cooperation. So I think that sort of dynamic kicks in at the local level versus sort of the, the non-rival relationship. I don't see in the foreseeable future the affiliation to ISIS or Al-Qaeda subsiding. I think both organizations are, it's more than viable that both organizations will have a comeback. I don't see either one of them as sort of irrevocably defeated. So I think that that will continue to be uh, very salient in the environment for, not, I can't say forever, right, but for the foreseeable future, I think that, that those will remain, um, those will remain viable. Having said that, with a lot of the Al-Qaeda affiliates, over time Al-Qaeda said, you don't have to emphasize the Al-Qaeda part as much. You don't have to sort of shove that at people. You can, maybe you should use another name locally. Maybe you should, but the alliance was still very much operating behind the scene, but why don't you call yourself Ansar al-Sharia? So it's not really about the Al-Qaeda thing. So there was a de-emphasization of that. That's why Al-Shabaab didn't change its name, right? They started to move away from that, like, hardcore labeling in that same kind of way. ISIS is still in the hardcore labeling phase. So it'll be interesting to see if that progression happens with them as well. Yes? Um, so you talked a little bit earlier about the problems that terrorist groups have uh, signaling and their, like, potential when they're looking to form alliances, you know, the Springer Bell rules of don't take notes on your uh, clandestine wiggle operation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, don't have um, meeting notes, yeah. yeah. Um, do you, is that a dynamic that groups seem to be aware of? Do you see them trying to manipulate those signals when they're courting in an alliance partner where they like start increasing the complexity of attacks to try and show that this is something they're capable of? Or is it just a, or is it um, more of a background factor? I think that the, the attacks, it, it's more likely to follow the attacks and the attacks be a deliberate effort to attract them. Like when the PFLP conducted that big first hijacking in 68, everyone started to wanting to come into their camps. 
Same after 9-11. Al-Qaeda had been trying to get a lot of these groups to ally with it before 9-11. And then 9-11 happened and people were like, maybe we should ally now, right? So the attacks had that effect. Um, I think one of the things that I've seen them do is Al-Qaeda was really low on money after 9-11. And it's still sort of postured to some of the affiliates that there was a piggy bank back there. They didn't exactly let them. And then they have formula lines and then, for example, all of a sudden Al-Qaeda is asking AQI for money. And you're like, I think you went into this sort of acting like you had money. And then you're, so it, it, that the relationship didn't go in the direction that maybe it was sort of pitched as. Um, and I don't think they project themselves sort of honestly in terms of what their weakness is during the alliance formation process. Yeah, I think that's, that's true, but it's not so much specific attacks. It's more like how they, how they convey themselves as a partner. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, in your professional experience, what alliance did you see form that surprised you most, that perhaps seemed the most, uh, like, you wouldn't expect these two groups to either attend this alliance or even successfully build one? At the time uh, that I was looking at it, of course, I was really immersed in it. The, GS, the, the prevailing wisdom was that the GSPC Al-Qaeda one wouldn't go through. No. Um, the, the sense was that, that it wasn't viable. And I think... I understand why, in retrospect, not least of which, that we didn't really have a good understanding of it. I tended to lean towards it happening, but I wasn't right for the right reasons. That's not my official story, but that's what I would tell you. Oh, it's on tape. Um, <laughs> surprising ones. That's an interesting question. I have, this is, this is not exactly an answer to your question, it's more of a, from a longevity standpoint, I have often been sort of surprised at the longevity of the Al-Qaeda-Taliban relationship. That by all real politique explanations, that alliance should have collapsed multiple times. Um, yeah, I think the Boko Haram ISIS one, some people were surprised by that. I wasn't, because Boko Haram had been trying to get into the Al-Qaeda alliance sphere and had a relationship with AQIM, but Al-Qaeda, it was way too undisciplined for Al-Qaeda. So I think some people were surprised by that, but I think I was less so. But that's an interesting question. I'm gonna probably be thinking like 2 a.m. right when I wake up and be like, this was surprising. But really none of them jumped to mind off the top of my head is really surprising me. Um, that's a good question though, I like that question. Still thinking about it, yes. Um, sorry, just another question. Um, from what we've heard, all the alliance structures between terrorist groups in the international level are somewhat centralized, where there's a hub that has a significantly more finance resource and power and tech, uh, tactical ability yeah. um, than, than there are small groups behind that. Is there any different structures, um, on the, for example, on a regional level? Is there a more egalitarian, decentralized structure of cooperation, and are there differences between them? One of the things that I realized in, do, in, in researching these is that a lot of Sometimes, especially before like the franchising, when we were not talking about those kinds of relationships, the terrorist groups <laughs> try to portray the alliance as two behemoth powerful groups coming together. And it's not until you interrogate more deeply that you realize that one of those groups is no longer what it says it is. That, I think, was most prevalent with Al-Qaeda and Egyptian Islamic Jihad. When they formed that alliance, the sense was like, oh my, these are, this is two of the heavy hitters coming together. But when you look back more deeply now, you see that by then EIJ is like a couple dozen guys and like their cousins who they're paying. Like it's there in a bad way at that point. Um, so a lot of the relationships that I looked at had some, something of a hierarchical, maybe not very, very strong, but certainly a direction to it. There weren't a lot of them that were truly equal, two among equals, which I think was part of when I was interrogating it what was a signal to me that there was this organizational weakness that was driving it. Eventually, when I'm looking at it, I didn't see a lot of those true equals. Even when Al-Qaeda cooperated temporarily, temporarily with Hezbollah in the 90s, Al-Qaeda is the weaker party trying to learn how to do these kinds of attacks. So even there, that was the case. So I, and if there are other structures like that, they're much more rare. Although that, that power dynamic can change once the alliance is formed. The powerful group can go to being the less powerful. That can alter over time. I know it's lunchtime, but I kept you with me. <laughs> Any other questions? What, do you want him back up? <laughs> oh, there he is. I really appreciate you guys coming. It's fun to see you.